Welcome to Military Faith and Spiritual Resilience. This is Elizabeth Fulgaro. With me today is Alexandra Siliazar, sister to former U.S. Marine Abraham Siliazar. Thank you for being here again today, Alexandra. It's great to see you again, Elizabeth. You have been such a faithful sister to your brother who called you my sister, which I just think is so beautiful. And um, you stepped into this role of advocate for him, and now you're a little bit more involved in his life because he can't really take care of himself. What happened with the relationship between the two of you? Oh boy, that was such a beautiful relationship. Um, my brother, in many ways, felt like my son, only because mm-hmm. I wanted to protect him so much mm-hmm. and take care of him. And uh, again, having that experience of working in a hospital and being a health provider um, was very uh, automatic for me to step into and speak to the doctors. And I utilized that, um, to my advantage because I could speak the, both the medical language. I need the resources. Um, I also know that, you know, things change between shifts you know, mm. and between admissions and between hospitals and healthcare and what, with all due respect, there's that beautiful insurance, you know, that has to make those payments and they have to make everything billable and how long can a person stay and what tests need to be done and, um, and the liabilities. And I remember one day when I came in to see my brother in one of the many hospitalizations, he was not able to swallow and um, he was having fluids into his lungs and there was a possibility that he might need surgery because he could choke and die. And I realized, oh my gosh, I have to make this life decision because if they do this little apparatus that they need to give him, will he have the ability to clean it, to understand it? Oh my goodness. Or, you know, to know what happened. And I knew the answer would be no, because he has not been able to understand the other things he needs to do, including when his glasses break because he has seizures. I need to ask for more glasses. Hmm. He would not ask the doctor or his social worker. He would say, sister, sister, Hmm. my glasses broke. Can you help me? Oh, my goodness. And so suddenly I needed to make this huge decision. But his life needed to be saved. And in that moment... I said, God, please help us because I can't make this decision. I can't do this. And within seconds, the doctor came to me and said he was able to swallow. We will not need the surgery. Oh, literally, praise God. God is so praise God. beautiful. 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 But I realized that all of us can be that patient any second, and for all of us that can be listening to this, it's the moment we need to really get up and and write in detail what we would like for us if a loved one has to take care of us because we don't want to have a loved one be in that same predicament. The responsibility is just much too great. And we need to pray that God gives us the ability to have that understanding and to guide us to whatever he needs us to do. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. How was it that you were the decision maker and your parents were not? Again, I think having the experience of working oh, in the working medical in the hospital, world. Sure. Yeah, it was easy. It was just easy. Why should they have to learn the language, quote unquote? Yeah, I know. I think it was wonderful that you could do this for him. God prepares us. Yes, he does. And, and how was it for him to always see your beautiful, smiling face next to him? He had a better smile than mine. Did he really? Oh, my gosh. His smile was the sweetest thing in the world. No matter how he felt? No matter how he felt. 
Was he aware of all the things going on in his body? He was aware, but I don't think he understood them. Okay. I mean, he would say, like, like with his broken hand. Yeah. My hand hurts. It's broken. No, it's not. Um, he's in the hospital for this and that, but nobody assaulted me. Or, you know, you're vomiting. Yes, let's go see the doctor. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but he would always tell me, and he knew, um, He, I, I became his power of attorney. He was perfectly fine with that. Okay. He was perfectly fine with me becoming his conservator. He was perfectly fine with that, but I needed attorneys. I'm sorry, I needed um, doctors to sign off on this mm -hmm. because it came in the paperwork. I needed to have a doctor say, yes, this person does need it. And I was never able to really get that signature. Explain, please, for those who may not understand, what's the difference in authority that you would have if you had a conservatorship? Based on your non-attorney yes. understanding, right? Yes. So if any okay. attorneys are listening, I, I you know, I, I do You're have to that. say I'm not an attorney. <laughs> I'm not a judge. I'm yeah. not an expert. But I'm a, a sister who absolutely loves my brother. Um, example. Um, one day, my brother had been vomiting, and I was caring for my daughter. I couldn't really get to him. Um, and when a person vomits so much and they're so dehydrated, um, they can become delusional. Mm -hmm. And he was delusional. And it took me a while because this was through the phone to understand what was happening. And at one point in one conversation, he was telling me that someone had come into the apartment into his room and was moving things and taking things mm. and I kept saying okay let me talk to them let me understand what's going on and he I could hear him saying to the person like leave that alone um just just leave just leave that alone and I thought what's going on and you know let, let me talk to this person um moving forward I decided to call someone in the lobby of the building he lived in And I said, can you please go check on my brother? Something's going on. There's someone there and something's going on. Can you help him? The person went, checked, and there was nobody there the whole time. Mm. And I realized something was going on with my brother. And so I went ahead and called uh, 911. The ambulance came in. Um, I stayed with my brother on the phone. And I told him somebody would be coming in and knocking on the door. Uh, apparently police and ambulance showed up. And because a person has the right to decline services, and he was saying it, nothing was wrong with him. And I mm. had, luckily, him on the phone. And I said, Abraham, could you please hand the phone to, to, the, to the EMT? And I explained to the EMT what was going on. And I explained about the brain injury. And they don't have the legal authority to take someone oh. would be considered a 5150. Now the police was there and they, I spoke to them. They were a bit, you know, upset and grudgingly agreed to take him against his will. And they, they took him to the hospital and he was hospitalized. And I think that was actually the time that he almost died. And, you know, what I explained earlier with the doctor telling me he wasn't able to swallow. But he was he was uh, psychotic, and it was because of the dehydration. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many days it had been for him. Oh, he had course. been vomiting. But I was able to speak to that and moving extremely forward. Um, I called the ambulance on a second and one last occasion where my brother had called me and said he was ill and it was nighttime and having to take care of my daughter just for everyone listening. I'm a single mom and so I had no one to take care of my daughter if I left. So I asked, you know, um, I try to assess, um, not being a doctor, but I try to assess, you know, COVID had already started and I was checking on symptoms. And I said, can I send you a taxi? And he said he wanted me to take him to the hospital, mm -hmm. but I would have had to leave my... I, I, it, was, it was a tough decision. 
And he said, no, you know, I, I don't feel well. I, I just want to stay on my bed. You know, he wanted to stay home. And I get it. When I don't feel well, I want to stay and cuddle Me in my bed too. instead of going into a hospital oh, with those big sure. lights and everyone poking at you. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, you know, I, I'll, I'll go in the morning. And I thought, okay, please tell me if anything changes. Call me mm -hmm. if anything changes. And we hung up the phone. And I thought, you know, I forgot to ask him if he could breathe. You know, because those were some of the symptoms we were told with COVID. If you can't breathe, go to the ER oh, immediately. Sure. Yeah. So I said, I forgot to ask him that. And then his phone was off the hook. At first, I didn't understand if he was calling someone, but it was just not answering. So I became more anxious and more anxious. I think I must have called at least 13 times. And I called the ambulance that day, that night. And I said, you know, my brother's not answering. Can you go? And I asked the uh, person who answered the phone, when the ambulance gets there, would you please have them call me mm -hmm. so I could convey to them the situation. Mm -hmm. I gave them time. I didn't hear anything. I called back dispatch. Dispatch told me they had already come and gone and left. And quote, he didn't want to go. No, actually take that back. They said, they asked him, had you called the police? Had you called the ambulance or did you call 911? And he said, no. No, he didn't. You did. Because he didn't. Yeah. And he never knew that I did. Yeah. And the ambulance left. I believe that if I had had in the ambulance, and dispatch would not tell me what happened. Mm. I asked, you know, did they take vitals? Did they do anything? They wouldn't tell me anything. To this day, I don't know. If you'd had conservatorship, how would that have been different? I would have said, I am the conservator. Mm -hmm. This person needs to be in the hospital. They're gravely ill. And they need to go in for an evaluation. It would have been the easiest that. And it would have been done. It would have been done. Could your brother have refused at that point? He could have refused, but I think I would have been able to at least explain to them the depth of the situation of why he can't really understand what's going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And because of COVID, I hadn't seen him for a while, and I was not allowed into the building either. As you might remember, people were not allowed to see their loved ones even when right. they were in buildings. I think that if I had been the primary caretaker, quote unquote, legally, the conservator, legally, maybe I would have mm -hmm. allowed me to come in. I think that I would have had the ability to really talk to the doctors through the multiple hospitalizations, not to release him when they did release him, or to notify even one of the last hospitalizations he had earlier that spring of 2020, uh, right at the very early stages of the pandemic, um, I came to pick him up from one of the hospitalizations and I saw that he couldn't walk more than 20 feet. Oh my he was completely unsteady. Mm -hmm. And I said, there's no way I can take him. No way I can take him that way. And the nurse was just like up in arms. Like I had to leave him because he had to take him because he had been discharged and I was just there to take him. And I said, I can't. So she said, okay, well, you know, um, I'll tell the charge nurse in the morning and they will call you. The next day I learned he was discharged and nobody called me. And he went home alone. And that was one of the last, if not the last hospitalization that I was aware of until. Oh my goodness. So it would have changed a lot. When he was released early and he was unstable, in other words, would he have fallen less? if he hadn't left the hospitals early so many times? I think that many things needed to have happened, including in-depth look and studies into why he's vomiting so much. So that never happened? That never happened. Would that have happened if you were a conservator? Absolutely. Yeah. I would have definitely asked that they keep him long enough to have all these tests done. I think it was a lot of patchwork done and out the door. Patchwork done out the door. Sometimes they didn't even want him there. I involved Adult Protective Services um, mm -hmm. early on. Even one of the social workers through APS was shocked. I, you know, at first they think, oh, of course they're not going to do that. But when she realized um, that she had to actually get into a bit of a argument uh, with the ER doctors, realized that they didn't really want to keep him in the hospital. What was the reason? Why do, why do you, now you're postulating, right? You don't know. But why do you think they didn't want to keep him? 
I think he was a revolving door and he kept refusing. He kept wanting to leave. And so it became like they needed um, uh, a sitter to sit with him. Mm -hmm. Um, They, Mm -hmm. they, it it was, um, he was incredibly sedated. Um, Maybe there was a liability there. Um, the cost of insurance, you know, there's only so many times a person, you know, ins- Medi- Medicare and all insurances will pay how many times you go to the ER per year. And I'm sure he had exceeded the amount, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I think that there had cost and, um, and, you know, the way he was really treated, um, there was one horrible incident horrible and I wrote a grievance and I'm very patient but I wrote a grievance and it was the tail end of the earlier um, report when I informed when I said that the security guard had told him to stay and he ended Uh up in the ICU this was the tail end of that hospitalization now the unit is sort of like a square shape um, and he kept wanting to leave and he had a sitter walk, actually two, because one was trying to hold him because he was was so wobbly and the other one was just coming along and he just kept wanting to leave. And he says, I want the exit. Even though he would walk right through the sign that says exit, he would still try to find the exit. He couldn't find the exit. And I was trying to convince the doctor. And at this point for a few months, I was carrying with me the conservatorship paperwork, wherever I went. And I kept saying, here, please sign, please Mm -hmm. sign, Mm -hmm. you know. And I am there with the doctor. And she tells me the reason, her rationale for not signing. She says, you know, I asked him, how would you go home? And he said he would take the 48. Um, And so that shows me he knows how to take care of himself. And I thought, how interesting, because he keeps passing the exit sign and can't figure out where the Mm. exit is. Yes. Memory is not gone. He knows by memory he takes the 48 bus to go home. Does not mean he knows how to take care of himself. But as this conversation is happening, I see security marching along super fast towards his room. So I go quickly and I go see what's going on. And they are furious with him and yell at him. But because of him, they keep being called in. And this time he was going to be thrown out if he uh, arrested, actually arrested. So I know you can see me. I'm only five feet tall. And my brother at this time (laughs) is probably 90 pounds. I have no idea how thin he is. He's really thin. I looked gigantic next to my brother. Oh my goodness. And The security yells at him and says, with all his bravado, says, go on, hit me, hit me to my brother. And I knew what they were doing. They were trying to have my brother put arms on them so they could do something to him. My brother is incredibly a pacifist, one of the sweetest people. And my brother was just looking at him like, what is going on? He looked like a deer in headlights. And he just said, I just want to go home. I just want to go home. And I got in the middle and I said, don't touch my brother. Mm. And he called a code saying that he was going to have two people arrested. And that was going to be me as well. And I said, why? And he said, I was obstructing justice. And I said, I am trying to tell you to stay off my brother. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm telling you, leave him alone. A lot of people came in, a lot of MPs, security, including the big chief, their big supervisor comes in. At this point, my poor brother, you know, I said, honey, come on, let's just lay down on the, everybody left the room when all these codes were being called. And I called my brother, I was really concerned for his safety. He lay down on the bed and I was just soothing him. And he said, sis, don't get in trouble because of me, sis. Oh, he got it. And I said, honey, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Don't you worry about me. It's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. And whereas the doctor was refusing to sign the release, uh, the uh, conservatorship papers, at this point, he was on a 5250. And I said, I want him lifted. I'm taking him home with me now. 
Even though I believed he needed to be there clinically, he was no longer safe. Oh my goodness, it makes sense. Could you explain just briefly what a 5250 is? Yes. So um, a 5150 first is Mm -hmm. uh, a three-day psychiatric hold for when a person is deemed to be both in danger of hurting themselves or hurting others due to a psychiatric condition, not for any other criminal other issues, but psychiatric issues or gravely disabled, um, again, due to psychiatric. And after a three-day hold, if a person is deemed to be a continuous threat to themselves, others, or gravely disabled due to psychiatric issues, they can be on a 5250, and that goes into a 14-day hold. Um, Then you could have um, further issues with, you know, a, a a judge can come in, they can look at, at a short-term uh, conservatorship, a temporary conservatorship. My brother never really made it. He was not psychiatric. Um, they, it did not necessarily cover his um, traumatic brain injury. Uh, was not covered on, under the, uh, you know, grave disability or... It was always an argument. It was always an issue. And it became... Unfortunately, almost the focus, and it shouldn't have been the focus. I, I wanted just to be able to speak on his behalf and to be his, you know, conservator to make decisions and speak to doctors without always having to have an argument and and, a, mm-hmm. and have all that tension. But it became that versus actually ever really getting the care he needed. And that really is, was the whole battle, wasn't it? Yeah. I, it's not that I wanted to be his conservator is that I wanted to have the ability to make those clear decisions and speak on his behalf and advocate that they do the tests that they never really fully did or the referrals that never really did take place. Makes so much sense. Makes so much sense. Is that what you wanted and that's what you needed? Can we continue next time? Absolutely.